So welcome to This Cycling Life. Uh, today, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Bernard Munemann. And what we're going to talk about today is our ongoing research on the champion's mindset. So Bernard, welcome to you. Great to chat with you as always. Why don't get, we get started on, I guess, one of the first principles of the champion's mind that we've discovered in our recent conversations with people like Matt Heyman, um, self-belief. Uh, yeah, first of all, well, uh, thank you for uh, having me again. And yeah, self-belief, I think it is a very important one as it is under pressure right now. I mean, with this uh, pandemic, I mean, for a lot of people that even are pretty self-confident, there might be some, some doubts. And it is very important to have a good self-belief. And out of the, 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 let's say, all the contacts I have with a lot of people that I coach or I mentor, I see for a lot of people that one of the reasons why sometimes the self-belief is, is a little low is because they, they're not always used to, res, uh, to handle resistance. And sometimes it comes from the fact that they, they think that the resistance comes because of them. So what am I doing wrong? What's going on with me? And I try to explain to them like, well, you got to understand that everybody feels resistance. But with everybody, I also mean you as a body. Because if you think about that, every object, when, when you are on a bike, the, the faster you ride, the more resistance you feel. When you're swimming, you feel resistance. So I think we kind of forgot that resistance is part of life and it makes us stronger because, you know, when you can overcome resistance, that's what you need to become stronger. So I think in the last months, because of the pandemic, a lot of people got a little bit in panic and they're like, now I hear a lot, yeah, but I feel all kinds of resistance. It's like, of course, but before you were so much in your comfort zone and it was so convenient that you didn't even feel that there was resistance because for that resistance, you were kind of used to work with it, but now it's a new one. Yeah, because- and I think that's I think that's interesting, man, Bernard, because I think this this idea of self belief becomes difficult at times of crisis, right? And I think that's one of the things we see with with true champions is that they are really able to contextualize things, right, um, and to appreciate that. Yeah, it's natural at the moment to maybe be feeling some anxiety or some stress because of what many of us have been going through with the pandemic, um, but ultimately it is about that that belief. Um, that you you can win. The other thing I, I, I guess that struck me in our conversations with several former professional cyclists recently um, has been this idea that you also need to not just believe in yourself, but also to push yourself. Um, this idea that, you know, when you're in training, you think of yourself as second best, <laughs> you know, because that will motivate you and inspire you but the moment you're on the start line of the race you believe that you can be the winner you're not second best on the day you're the best on the day so i think this idea of self-belief for me also overlaps a little bit with this kind of hard work ethic right that ultimately self-belief can only come when you believe that you've done the work that it will take to win what's your take i mean you work with hundreds of, of, of young aspirational people who have a dream to be a winner. But when does it become, you know, when does it become a reality? I think it's when, when the, the, the ambition or the desire meets that, that hard work. What, what's your experience being well, with that? It's, you're, you're right. It, it has to do with heart. And we say hard work. I would call it rather the right work. You know, because not always do you need to work very hard in the meanings you got to physically suffer a lot. It's, it's, it's doing the right work. And then you need, before that, you need to have goals. You need to have your why clear. You have to have a good relationship with your coach mentor. And then if you're doing the right things, then in the week, you want to train yourself as you're still behind because you need to conquer that but once you are ready for your race or your game you got to say like well i am as ready as i can be as i did what i needed to do i followed the plan 
eating, sleeping, training, uh, doing reckoning, uh, all that. So then your self-belief should come by the fact that what you did in a structured way the days before and with your deliberate practice, that's why it needs to be deliberate practice because that means you learn every time from, from your practice and you have a good feedback se uh, session with your coach, then you're ready and then you should have the self-belief that you need to go in the, in the game or in the race. But you're right, in your week of training, there you want to act as if you're still second and want to get up there to become first. So that's to me the way to go. And honestly, knowing what you're doing, uh, knowing why you are doing it, because nobody can, can, can really stay that disciplined to achieve something if it's not really according with its why. Or her why? If you if you have that, that's I call it always the lever for your energy. That opens the lever to to let your energy flow. Yeah. So I guess to summarize, I mean, uh, and to me, it makes a lot of sense. So of course, I guess this self belief comes from um, having that that you know, of course the desire, the drive, the ambition, purpose. You know, of not just what you're doing, but why you're doing it. But equally. Um, you can only really believe in yourself when you have actually done the hard work to be there, to be in the competition, whether that's in sport or in, or in life. And then ultimately that's not about in a way lying to yourself because you know that you've done everything possible um, to be able, able to thrive. But I think it's interesting how you mentioned this idea of, of your why. And we often, you and I often talk to writers we're mentoring um, to, to also people in business who were mentoring um, about purpose and I think that comes to the second aspect of the winner's mind that you and I always talk about which is is maintaining that enjoyment and that passion um, for what you what you do I mean in your experience when, when with, with so many of the young guys that you work with here in Belgium who are coming over to try to make it as professionals what was what was your experience in witnessing that? You know, the riders who you could see would wake up in the morning simply with a joy for doing what they were doing, suffering in the Belgian wind and the rain and the mud, um, compared to those who maybe you saw not having that same excitement or enjoyment, looking more as a, you know, just a job perhaps. What, what, what was the differentiator there? Well, the, the huge difference is all the guys that really, that came over from wherever, and had as goal that they wanted to figure out how far they could go. Those guys went in life way further than all the guys that just came and, and wanted to become a very good bicycle uh, cyclist because, you know, it tend to be that a lot of guys that were good cyclists in that country, champion of a state or even the country. I mean, what they forgot is that, let's face it, the racing over here is different than the approach of racing. I'm not saying it's not as hard. It's different. Mm -hmm. I always, I, I am not so familiar with the Australian racing scene, but like in America, a race, that's a day of, of, of festivity. That's a fancy fair because there's racing from the morning till the, uh, from, yeah, from morning till the evening, all kinds of ages. So it's a kermess, a carnival. Here in Belgium, it's dead serious business. You will have seen that even, even for the races you do. I mean, guys, they come in, they do their race, and they go out. I always say it here, they're raced like the fire brigade. Get in, <laughs> you, know, you know, fight the fire yeah. and go home. Yeah, and it was interesting what you say about that because, you know, I mean, I kind of have a reputation here in Belgium, you know, in, in the Kermis, in the master scene where I race as kind of the, the happy Australian guy. Um, because you are right, you know, when I get on the start line here in Belgium and I look around, there's an awful lot of frowns and serious faces. And um, even in the race itself, there's often anger and shouting and everything like that. Um, however, I, I, that's not the way I race, you know. Um, of course, I, I can be feeling some, some stress and a little bit of anxiety, but, but actually, usually when I'm on the start line, I'm smiling and, and I'm, I'm saying hi to the guys around me. And even when I'm in the race, you know, if, if people are shouting at me, sometimes I get abuse. It happens, right? I, I just answer back, hey, guys, that's not needed. Let's, let's enjoy. We're here because we all have – we, we love this, right? Um, and it's interesting the effect that has on people sometimes. Sometimes they look at you kind of a bit shocked or surprised that you're actually being kind to them or nice or, or showing a joy in the middle of this painful experience. 
However, for me as a person, that helps me to perform, I feel, you know, because well, by, by, yeah, expressing my, my love, my joy, my passion for, for the sport, being in it, I don't know. I think it helps me to relax, to keep a clear head and not to allow myself to be overwhelmed by anger or, or, or yeah, frustration. So, But you're so right because it's not because it's done the way it is done over here that it's the right way. At the end of the day, whatever you do, you do the things the best that you enjoy. Mm. And let's face it, racing over here in Belgium, a lot of times a brutal wind, rain, and the combination of that with the freezing cold. So the external things, the external context is not enjoyable. Yeah. So if you then see it too that serious, and I think this is also the reason why if you look at the percentage that like Australians, there are more Australians that make it than if you compare the percentage than Belgians. But that's one of the reasons because Australians and others, they come over and they want to see how far they can get. And they also enjoy the discovery journey mm. where here, because it's a popular sport, nobody cares about your journey. You got to win right away. And yeah, you won yeah, as a yeah. junior, so you win as, a, as an yeah. amateur. Do you understand? It's, it's funny. It's funny what you say about that because I mean, of course, not just at, at the level we're talking about. You know, the the guys you work with, the young people who were were you know elite without contract. You know, trying to get a, a role. Me racing in the Masters. Um, our friend Dan Jones recently uh, hosted a wonderful interview with Dave Brailsford. How Dave Brailsford was also talking about the fact that his team and Ineos were starting to realize that that joy, enjoyment, excitement. They needed to bring more of that into the team. Because what they were starting to see is this pure focus on performance, on analytics. It was taking the joy and the passion out of the sport for their riders. So it's interesting that we're seeing this coming in now also at the pro level. And I guess we see cultures um, and you often speak about um, uh, quick step as a team, you know, the wolf pack, that, that, that enjoyment in, in the unity, the collaboration, green edge. The, the, the Aussie guys who we know all so well, you can see that as part of the culture as well. But I think that should, you know, lead us into the next sort of part of the discussion, which is, you know, as part of this champion's mindset, you know, we don't just talk about the need for self-belief, the need to, to have enjoyment in what you do, but also there's a piece there around, um, you know, what we call the language of a champion, you know, the language um, of, of a winner. And that is, is, manifested in two ways one is the actual language the verbalization but it's also about the it's it's not just the language and the verbalization it's also about the body language right um so uh, when i think about that myself right um for me it's kind of these mantras that i have which actually i learned a big part of from my coach alan davis who, who really encouraged me to talk to myself during events you know um, to, to give yourself self-affirmation during events. When we interviewed Matt Heyman recently, you know, Matt Heyman said, when I'm on the start line or when he was, you know, even in races like Paris-Roubaix, I would lie to myself. You know, I would tell myself, you're, you, you're the best today. You can do it. So for me, it's very interesting how, how this, this self-affirmation, word self-affirmation comes in. What, what's your experience with that, Bernard? The importance well, of language. The, well, it is, it, it is right what you say, that, that you, we are all sensible for what we observe because we do that from when we were a little kid. We, we want to we wanna hear things and we're watching things. So whoever talks to us, if you want to, to be trusted, you need to talk uh, about the truth and you need to act just according to what you were saying. So those two need to be in line and then you build trust. That's your general rule for everybody, sporter, uh, when you go to work, but even also for yourself. And when I say you got to, the truth, you can say like, well, Bernard, how do you know that you've got to win? Well, this, that's again, the first part, the self-confidence where you said, I did everything I needed to do. Now I'm ready to win. And then you, stay, you, you become in a, a mental mindset where that's your truth. You have the ability to win. And then you make sure that you act upon that. And those two things, 
have a, a certain acceleration in yourself about the self-belief and it also needs to come from your coach i mean a perfect example a perfect example is the video of you racing last week uh on on the imola uh, world champion uh, course there and winning with alan you can see the, 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 your body language and his facial expressions where you can really see what he's saying it is with 300 empathy and you receive that empathy so there is a saying people don't uh understand or don't uh remember what you said they don't remember what you did but they always remember how you make them feel yeah. so we are sensitive for this and if you as the sporter get that language yeah. from your leader then you, you and you can even lead yourself yeah. but you need to get that positive and you can work towards that but that's that's let's say the mechanics behind it and that's that's proven already years ago and a person that can prove that a very easy way as a fabric uh, frederick fabricius she can really based on neuroscience explain that how it works and it makes total sense because we all feel that but yeah, obviously but that's that's, right? that's super important i think i mean you mentioned the two aspects i mean the language you know i talk about the the, the, the mantras and we from psychology also we understand that this can have a very positive reaffirming effect for ourselves so you know for me um, one that Alan brought in you know in over the years of us racing together often when I'm in a race sometimes he's behind me in a car or a motorbike and I have an earpiece in and you know his, his simple mantra to me two kilometers from the finish is you can win this you can win this um, that becomes my own mantra now even if Alan is not there when I'm coming into a finish then I will repeat that mantra to myself. And, and this is what the psychology research says, that these mantras have to be very simple, they have to be positive, and they have to keep you in the moment of the now. Because often what happens is, of course, in the moment of stress, of pressure, our mind wanders. We have a negativity bias, which our friend, the neuroscientist Frederica Fabricius talks about. So our mind can wander onto negative things. And what's the negative things? The bad things that can go wrong. So this self-talk, it needs to be positive, it needs to be simple and it needs to be focused in the moment. Now, of course, what you observe with Alan in the DJ 100, the virtual race last weekend, he did exactly the same, right? Yeah. It was very simple. It was very positive, And it was very focused on keeping me in that moment of where I was in the race. So I think yeah. that's, that's also important. The last thing, of course, again, going to the neuroscience of this is that um, we know that body language is also important. So, for example, the research shows that if you put yourself into a power pose, you make yourself feel big, that will actually trigger the relief of dopamine and endorphins in your system, which will make you feel better. So that's what I do, right? And, and uh, you know, when I go to a big race, UCI World Series, Grand Fondo kind of, kind of level, um, big target events, before I race, I always try to go a few hours before or even the day before. And what I do is I, I, I ride the last two, 300 meters of that course, not just to, to get the course in my mind to, to, to recon the course, but to cross the line with my hands in the air. Because what I'm doing there is visualizing and giving myself that, that feeling of what it would be like to win, which can make, make that, you know, we talk about the, Brails talk about incremental gains, but from a psychological perspective, we know that, that that can help us. Let's move on, Bernard. Let's talk about talk about fortitude. You know, this idea that, you know, to be a champion, this champion's mindset also involves this aspect of, of resilience. Yeah, well, you, you, there, there will be things happening that you didn't like, getting sick, uh, races get postponed because of corona, or you make a crash. Well, yeah, then uh, once again, if it's all structured and you know why you're doing it, you, you will feel the bump, but you will be resilient enough to bounce back or to bounce even higher afterwards. And But that's something to me that comes pretty automatic when the other things are fulfilled. So when there is self-belief, when there is enjoyment, I mean... You, you will not bounce back from things you're not enjoying already. Mm. <laughs> you're in, you want to bounce back because you enjoy it. The last moment that was good, you enjoyed it. And now there is something, something happened. So you had to bounce back. Well, the more you enjoyed it before, the more, the more you will want to go to that feeling again. So that's a huge motivator. So I think for the people, 
you, you don't need to worry too much about people, uh, their resilience. If all the other things are correct, the only thing you need to be careful for is then as a good coach, most of the times you got to hold the horses because the urge to get back there and get there quick, you know, you know the difference for a doctor working with civilians and a doctor working with a sporter. Mm -hmm. The doctor that works with civilians need to get the people healthy again. Yeah. The doctor working with a sporter needs to get, get the guy uh, healthy the day before he had a problem. Yeah. Do you understand? So yeah, yeah, yeah. he never wants, he, he wants to be back right away. Mm -hmm. And that fortitude, I think comes with the other three, but obviously it is important. But that, that's an interesting aspect. I mean, um, I mean, cycling is kind of unique as a sport, I think. I mean, maybe there's other sort of endurance kind of sports that are similar. But I remember early on in my cycling life, actually, one of my, my mentors, one of my coaches was my Uncle Les. And uh, I never forget Uncle Les said to me, maybe I was 14 years old, 15 years old. And, and he said to me that your success as a cyclist will depend upon the level of pain that you can endure in terms of pushing your body to the limit, training, and it hurts, it hurts. And still to this day, I'm almost 50 years old, but I think, I mean, you've seen photos of me in races, Bernard, when you can see the look on my face and it, it's hurting a lot. And, but I think that, that simple statement, it, it did affect me early on, that I realized that to get results, um, I would have to push myself. Now, I'm not saying hurting here in the sense of falling down and breaking bones, although I've done my fair share of that. It was more about that mental toughness. You know, some people call it the locus of control, you know, to push yourself when your brain is screaming at you to stop, when the twinges of cramp are coming on, but you you continue. Yeah. Um, so I think that is a, an aspect really, which is, is about toughness, is it not? Uh, well, obviously, yes, that's a word you can use. But just think about this. At that moment, you are getting passionate about it as well. And if we think where the word passion comes from, it comes from pain. You're doing something despite pain. So when you do the things you like doing, getting better in it or trying to get more in it, you are ready to endure pain more than in just something. To me, that's the big difference. So if when, that's the big difference also when you do something in your talents or if it's just a competence. When it's just a competence, you're not gonna endure a lot of pain, but if it's your talent, you really, towards yourself, you wanna prove that you, you're doing the right things, you wanna do more. And even if it hurts a little bit, and not always does it need to hurt physically, also mentally, let's say people want to to get somewhere else, a, a higher level in, in their job and they need to go to evening school. Let's say, let's face it, that's kind of painful. In the evenings, you're not at home, you're, you're, you need to do an effort. So it's about that passion that opens that door uh, where you're not even aware that it is pain. Mm. You, know, you, you, you feel it, but you kind of push the idea about like, is this hurting me? You're like pushing it away. That's a reason. Yeah. It can be dangerous as well because that's one of the reasons why athletes on their comeback of an injury sometimes try to come back too early. Too fast. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, again, I think about some of the, you know, the, 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 the experiences and, 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 and victories. And I never forget Stuart O'Grady um, talking about his win in Paris Roubaix, uh, and I remember he said, you know, that that he he would always say to himself in those moments, the deepest moments of pain and suffering, as he certainly experienced being in a breakaway in Paris Roubaix, every muscle on the edge of cramping. You know, he said he would say to himself that pain is temporary, but memories are forever. Yeah, and and I think this is also key. It's it's that that framing of the pain or the suffering or the hard work. Um, into that bigger picture, which is what you talked about, which is ultimately about your purpose and about the the, the dreams that you want to to achieve or to to aspire to. So, yeah, when I heard that, I thought it frames it those those words. Pain is temporary; memories are forever. For me, really captured it very well. And also, I mean, in the final of a race, when we talk about uh, a cycle, uh, bicycle race, 
Think about that. All the guys in the in, in the final are in pain. They're all are in pain. And so sometimes- maybe except Peter Sagan, maybe. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I think Peter but, probably also yeah. has. <laughs> But I, I think, you know, he could deal with it uh, better, like not showing it. But the thing is, yeah, sometimes there's some physical p- points there too. But for sure, the way you can mentally endure that pain is also, it's even a talent. Huh? Some people can do that better than others. And it's, it's not so much recognized, but they say, oh, he is suffering. Yeah, but everybody is suffering. I mean, there was an old uh, famous Belgian cyclist that said, the moment to attack is the moment you suffer because then you know the others are suffering as well. But it comes down to the same thing. Huh? It's, you know, enduring that pain and how much do you really want this? That And that part helps you. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand completely. Good, Bernard Mortimer, I think we should bring this one to a close. Terrific <laughs> conversation uh, as always. So for those of you who've been watching, um, if you have enjoyed this video, please do give us the thumbs up. Uh, of course, please do subscribe to the This Cycling Life YouTube channel. And we look forward to seeing you on another episode soon. Bernard Mortimer, thank you very much. Thank you very much and see you guys next time. Bye.